Good morning again. It's me, and I want to do a quick, very quick review. Um, we've looked um, in the book, Get Out of the Pit by Beth Moore, straight talk about God's deliverance, the definitions of pit and deliverance, because that's what we want is deliverance out of whatever pit we're in. Chapter one was life in the pit, and then Beth gives us chapter two, three, and four are about the pits that we get, that we find ourselves in, whether in chapter two, you're thrown into a pit, chapter three, we slip into a pit, and chapter four is when we jump into a pit. Um, and it doesn't mean that you are experiencing all three. You may just have found yourself in one of the pits. The difference between chapter four, two and three is that Chapter 4 indicates that we, <laughs> for whatever reason, made the plunge into the pit and we were very well aware of what we were doing. And unlike the second route into a pit, you didn't jump in before you knew what was happening. You had time to think, according to Chapter 4, she said you had time to think and then you did exactly what you meant to do, even if the pit turned out to be the deeper and the consequences higher than you had hoped. Amazing. On page 72, she says, throughout this entire chapter four, I want you to keep in mind that I lived a vast measure of my life cycling from one pit to another. I've made the trip all three ways and numerous times. Wherever you've been, I've probably been there too. Our paths in that pit and our length of stay may be different but I can't imagine that you sank any deeper than I did. So she owns up, even in writing this book, about experiencing when she jumped into the pit herself. Now, I know the pits that I've been in, and I'm very clear through going through this book and even looking back over time like we talked about on Monday, to take a journey back and look at where God has been faithful to you and to me in our lives and lifted his hand down and pulled us out of the pit. Now, there's been times that God has put his hand out for me to reach up and take. And I'll be honest, it was <clears throat> easier to stay in the pit. So for whatever reason, we choose to stay in our pits. It's been exposed now. It's time for every single one of us to say, enough is enough. I'm done with this pit, and I'm going to get out. So... If we want to experience the fullness of God's blessings on our life and the fullness of what he wants for us here on this earth and to experience the fullness of what he wants us to accomplish for his kingdom on this earth, we have to, and I, I know I've said this before, but we have to own up. We have to say, you know, like Beth, I've been in a pit, I'm in a pit now, or I'm out and I'm ready for God to use me and I'm ready to submit my thoughts and my judgments. I'm ready to take captive those thoughts and submit them to God's Word. The only way I know how to take captive my thoughts, and this is me, it's not you, I'm just telling you the way I do it, is if I feel myself going into stress or if I feel myself, my brain going into overload of creativity, of thinking <laughs> of things that could be happening that, 10 to 1, they really aren't, or what people might be thinking, or, you know, if I, if I feel myself drifting into that mental pit, I go straight to the Bible, and I look up a scripture that encourages me as a believer, and I stand on it. I have been even known, and my kids could tell you, for getting on my knees and just saying, God, help me, help me right now. And like I said to you the first day, we post scriptures throughout this house. I mean, as you're walking out the door, Nicole posted one on our door that says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live is Christ who lives in me. And so I go to the word and I stand on it as much as possible. Now, am I good at this? No, not every day. But I still remain fervent in my walk and in my study of God's word and there's days, I'll be very frank and honest, um, <clears throat> I just don't do it. I just get very frustrated and aggravated because I'm like, God, where are you? 
And that could be a pit if I wanted to stay there. Sometimes, you know, there have been a couple of days, and I hope a couple of my friends don't testify to this on Facebook, but I have stayed in that pit, and that's a chosen pit. Um, just like what she says, when you jump into the pit, I've chosen to just stay in that mental pit of God is not listening to me. I'm in a desert. He's not answering my prayers. And I'm not really happy with God right this moment. Only for a couple of days after prayer of other people over my life. And I let my friends know when I'm in this pit because I know I can't be in this pit, you know, without the strength of others to help me not plunge into it deeper. And they for sure keep me out. So that's the other thing that I want us all to look at is find yourself a group of friends. Well, okay, a group. A group to me is two or three. <laughs> and let them know, hey guys, I need your prayers. And ask them to pray you through this and to give you scriptures of encouragement, not of judgment, but of encouragement that is going to help you to overcome. And I'm going to be even so bold as to say, if you need to talk to someone, find a really sound biblical Christian counselor that you can talk to, to help you out of a pit like she's talking about, that when you jump in, you stay because you know you made that decision to stay in that pit. And go to church. I know sometimes when we're in a pit that we've chosen to jump into, going to church is the last thing we want to do. And attending a Bible study, especially reading a book and listening to some woman like myself on podcasts. But go to a church that's got worship that's going to take you out of yourself and put you into the presence of God and listen to the Word of God. Don't go to a church because of, you know, it's the social thing to do only. Now listen, I know that we've got to go to church. I mean, the assemblings of the assembling of the body of Christ is so critical in our lives, but you've got to find the church that's best for you. So now to get back to chapter four, if you have jumped into this pit, you know, regardless of what the reasons were, I love some of the examples that uh, Beth gives us on page 77 and 78. She says, a pit jumper, and these are the bullets, and I'm just going to give a few. These pit jumpers wanted to go to bed with that person. They wanted to have an affair. They wanted to take vengeance out on someone. They set out to hurt a person. They went into that relationship knowing full well that person was an unbeliever or even had a dark side. They wanted to experience something illicit. And they wanted to get drunker than a skunk, higher than a kite, lower than a snake's belly. <laughs> And she says, you get the picture when you, when you read these bullets. We make these choices, people. And then we have to understand we got to live up to the consequences of these choices. She says, Psalm 1913 gives a couple of names to a pit jumping, facing his own bent for jumping into pits. The psalmist pled with God, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be innocent and cleansed from blatant rebellion. So ladies, even in the word of God, David gave us an example that he cried out to God, please, every day, Lord, keep me from willful sins. Don't let them rule over me. In other words, give me that spirit of self-control. And she also adds at the bottom, and by all means, and this is the encouraging word that I have for you today, by all means, don't let anybody particularly someone tooting a twisted doctrine of grace, talk you into thinking you can't be liberated from willful sin and blatant rebellion just because he or she hasn't been. Listen, remember when we go back to day one, the definition of deliverance is liberation. So ladies, if you are in a pit, if you've chosen to jump yourself into a pit, you can be liberated from that. Listen to this scripture. James 1, 13 through 15, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's in full grown, gives birth to death. 
So ladies, we've got to understand that before we make that plunge into a literal choice of a pit, like she's talking about in chapter four, there are consequences to the choices that we make. It also impacts not just us, but those who are looking at us and those that are that are around us, our families, our friends, our churches. But the good news is this. If we have ever plunged into a pit like that, God is ready and standing, like he says in Psalm 40, to lift us out of that pit. He wants to liberate us. He wants to get us out of that erosion. He wants to get us out of all of the emotional torture and torment that whatever pit you're in, if you've thrown yourself in or you've been thrown in or you're slipping in, he wants to deliver us out of that. I want to give you this encouraging word found in Hebrews 4, 12. He says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges our thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This indicates to me that we need to stay in the Word of God. We need to stand. And remember back when we read on Monday, Tuesday, that the bottom line, He reaches out to pull us out of the pit to help us to stand on a rock. That foundation, which is the living Word, Jesus Christ. Therefore, indicating to me again that the Word of God is our way out. Those are our motivating and encouraging words to get out of a pit. So is this easy? No, it is a challenge. It is, it takes courage. And ladies, all of us have courage. All of us have been given the gift of discipline. We are disciples of Christ. We need to find one or two people that are good friends that will hold our feet accountable to the Word of God. We need to stay in the Word. We need to get in church we need to get into a good worship service, and we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and he forgave us for every single attitude, thought, behavior, whatever sin we've committed, but we don't need to take that lightly. We need to take that extremely seriously and recognize the love that he gave to us, and then we need to walk in it, and we need to live in it, and when we start feeling ourselves slip back, we need to go back to that and take captive that thought and say, no, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Trying to deceive us through the world, through people that judge us. We need to stay firm in his word and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your God, my God, he reigns, he lives, he forgives us, and he wants to bless us with every blessing under heaven. 28 says, as we fully obey the Lord and follow his commands, which is his word. If you look down at verse six and seven, he says, you'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from seven. God himself will fight our battles. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God, our provider in every area of our lives. Don't let the enemy put you in a pit of not believing that. He is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord God, our banner, who goes before us in every single battle that you face every single day. Just raise up that banner, which is the name Jesus Christ, and let him fight these battles for you. And lastly, Psalm 40, I'm going to read it again. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. So cry out to God right now. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. So take time today to praise him. Lift up the name of the Lord. Cover us all in prayer. And I'll see you at the next chapter.